Don't ignore the future. You have people right now in your company who are the future of your company. And too often we ignore their voices and don't listen to them when they are actually the future. Hello and welcome to The Daily Helping with Dr. Richard Schuster. Food for the brain, knowledge from the experts, tools to win at life. I'm your host, Dr. Richard. Whoever you are, wherever you're from, and whatever you do, this is the show that is going to help you become the best version of yourself. Each episode, you will hear from some of the most amazing, talented, and successful people on the planet who followed their passions and strive to help others. Join our movement to get a million people each day to commit acts of kindness for others. Together, we're going to make the world a better place. Are you ready? Because it's time for your daily helping. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Daily Helping Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Richard, and we have a brilliant guest to share with you today. His name is Jeff Thatcher, and he's the founder and chief creative officer at Creative Principles. He's had a long career creating brand experiences, vision centers, museums, theme parks, and live events before he launched his own experience design firm in 2017. His eclectic background always delivers a fresh perspective, and his experience included everything from the grand opening of the Warner Brothers World Abu Dhabi to the renovated American Airlines Museum in Texas. And whether it's creating the large video dome on a beach in Dubai or the opening ceremonies for the Pan American Games in Rio in 2007, Jeff has been there. He's also a writer and teacher. He's ghostwritten books, blogs, and even facilitated a communication workshop for the CIA. Jeff, this is going to be a great conversation. Welcome to The Daily Helping. Hey, thank you, Dr. Richard. Good to be here. Absolutely. So there's so many things that we're going to talk about, including your new book, which was recently released. So you've got a very interesting world that you live in, in terms of designing experiences. Talk to us about what got you into that world. Well, I grew up next to an amusement park. So I, as a child, would literally fall asleep at night by hearing the train whistle, you know, choo choo, and, and in hearing, uh, you know, the people on the microphones, so, you, know, you, know, you, know, you know, please keep your hands and arms inside the ride and have fun. And literally, we, we could wake up in the morning to the roar of the lions from the Animal Kingdom train that went around this amusement park. I, I literally grew up in a theme park. And I started going to its, its swimming pool. Uh, back then, there wasn't water parks. There were swimming pools. And so we would go to its swimming pool and have one of those cool, old, nostalgic metal slides and actually had diving boards, which don't really exist today. And I literally grew up at this amusement park. It was called Lagoon Amusement Park in Farmington, Utah, and started working there when I was 14. And unbeknownst to me, I ended up in this career. I never left. And so you know, I, I worked all the way through high school and college at Lagoon Amusement Park. I did everything from the train engineer to a lifeguard, a cleanup boy. Uh, I was a DJ, was a stuntman in the Wild West Shootout, a stage manager. And it was a blast. And, you know, graduated in journalism from college and immediately discovered that journalists in general are not happy people. And I missed the happy people that you work with at a theme park. I mean, when you work at a theme park, your job is making people happy. You, know, you, you bring smiles to people. It's fun. And, and I just wasn't getting that uh, out of journalism. And so, you know, Dr. Richard, I know from your own personal bio that happiness is important in your work. And it was for me as well. And so I got my lucky break in Cincinnati in 1995 and got a job at a creative uh, design firm called uh, JRA. And uh, we started working as a creative writer, you know, working for theme parks and museums and events and corporate experiences. And the rest really is history, as you say. So, in an, in, and that strongly resonates with me. And obviously, uh, happiness and purpose are critical. It's something that we talk about a lot on this show. And so for those listening, we have a lot of entrepreneurs listening to this show. Talk to us about, especially in, in the world we're living in now, in this coronavirus world, talk to us about the importance of creativity and how creativity can set your business apart from your competition. Well, um, you know, creativity is so hard to define for a lot of people. And I learned a very interesting lesson very early in my career. So, you know, I've been in journalism, I've been working as a reporter, 
and uh, editor. And, you know, I actually like the job, but when you work with grouchy people, you're not happy. You want to work with happy people. And so I get this job and my title is creative writer. And of course, you know, I'm in my 20s. I'm totally nervous. I'm a fraud. I, am I really creative? Can I actually do it? All those normal feelings that you have when you start a, a new job, especially when you're young. And I went into this meeting and I was introduced and everybody said, this is Jeff, our new creative writer. And, and everybody just assumed because I had that label that I was creative. And it really taught me very early in my career that it's very important what you are called and what label you are. Because even if you're a creative person and you get a job as a technical writer and that label gets attached to you, you'll never be able to break out of that mold. And it's the same with engineers and it's the same with other people and accountants is they just get these labels. And you know, it works in the other direction as well. I mean, I don't think I'm a, you know, a financial genius by any respects, but anytime I had anything to say with the business or anything to say with budgets or anything like that, people would immediately dismiss me and say, oh, he's just the creative one. You know, oh, he, he's just creative. We're not, we're not going to listen to anything he has to say about the business or about, or about uh, you know, the budget because he's just the creative one. So it goes both ways, but these labels are very important. So you do have to define what you want to be and make sure that you craft your career so you are called what you want to be. If you want to be creative, please don't take that job that's a technical writing job. And if you do have to take a temporary job in something you don't like, which we've all had to do, consider not taking a title. I did that once, actually. I, I got a job and I really wanted my next title in my career to be creative director and they weren't willing to give it to me. And so I just said, don't give me a title. And they were like, what are we going to put on your business card? I said, put nothing on my business card. And they're like, yeah, but what are you? And I said, I'm creative. That's all I am. But don't put anything on my business card. And so they didn't. And it was about six months later, I'd earned their trust and they just came to me and said, okay, okay, we'll give you the creative director title. I said, great. That's what I want. So they put the creative director title on it. But creativity, to answer your question, is really about making connections. Do you see the connections? And, you know, for example, with the book we had, I had it's a short story I'd written uh, about two years ago, uh, actually for longer than that, three years ago. And, uh, you know, I, I wrote it and just sat there. And a lot of us have that in our life where we, we get a spark of inspiration. We write something, we draw something, you know, we, we fiddle around with it. And then it just sits there and it sits there and it sits there. But on October 29th of this year, my daughter Zoe, who also is a designer for, for our firm, she posted on Instagram a, a sketch and it was a girl in a red scarf. And I saw this sketch and I immediately saw the connection between the style that was in her rendering, her sketch on Instagram with the story that we were telling in this book. And so I said, Zoe, that is the style. That is the style we need for the CEO's time machine. We've got to do it. Now, what made me make that connection? I have no idea. You know, people tell me all the time I'm creative. I don't know why I'm creative, but I know I'm able to make these connections. And sometimes I think what helps people to be creative is the more stimulus you get. It's impossible to make connections if you're not getting stimulus, if you're not having people, not surrounding yourself with food, if you're not surrounding yourself with visuals, if you're not surrounding yourself with video and reading. If you're not bringing in stimulus, it's impossible for you to make connections. So the first thing I would say to anybody who wants to be creative is, well, make sure that you're filling your life and filling your job full of a lot of inputs and stimulus that then will allow you to make those connections. And when you're talking about connections, it sounds like you're not talking necessarily about interpersonal relationships with other people. It's being able to connect the dots that people don't usually see. You know, there's two type of creative people, in my opinion. There's the studio creative who really feeds off other people and needs to be around other people and needs to bounce ideas off people. And that's, and that is a form of stimulus. But by the same token, there's also the hermit creative who, it's okay for them to go to a meeting and talk about it, but their real creativity happens in isolation. Their creativity happens in a cave, in a cubicle, at, at, at their laptop, on a design board. They really need that solitude in order to be able to think. I'm actually an extrovert, but I, when I 
to be creative, I need to be by myself because my, my, my discipline is a writer. And so I need to be left alone so I can write. There's nothing more annoying to me than people hovering over me while I'm trying to be creative and I'm trying to write. Uh, but other people thrive on that. They, they need to have people all around them. So really knowing you know, what, what's best for you is critical to the creative process is what I'm hearing. Absolutely. You need to know, are you a studio creative or are you a hermit creative? Okay. That makes total sense. And I, and I want to... What are you, by the way? You know, I have my moments of inspiration at any random time. I think uh, I'll just be you know, sitting around and I'll have a good idea. But I, I do get that. Like I need, I, I actually, I don't ever have people around me because I sit in front of my computer and I'm on Zoom calls and I'm in my little green screen and doing all these things. So as a solopreneur, I want to say, you know, I probably am the type who does best with, with solitude. Uh, but then again, I don't know because I'm not in an office environment. Yeah. So it's, it's an interesting goodness, question. Right? <laughs> who wants to work in an office? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, and that's something we talk about a lot on this show is, is being able to push people into doing what they want to do and into their freedom. So uh, I, I, that certainly resonates with me. Uh, Jeff, I want to take a moment and talk about what was the inspiration for creating CEO's Time Machine, which is now available everywhere. So I was working on a project in Saudi Arabia, and it was a traveling exhibition for the King Abdullah Foundation. And King Abdullah had just died. Uh, this was in 2016. And we were thinking a lot about uh, the past and a lot about the future. And I don't want to get into geopolitics here, but King Abdullah did something very interesting and very important to the future of Saudi Arabia when he started offering scholarships to college. And he sent literally hundreds of thousands of young Saudi citizens to the United Kingdom, to Canada, to the United States and other Western countries to get a college degree. And then they were, were required to come back and work. And the reason that you see some of these reforms that are happening in Saudi Arabia today, after King Abdullah died, was because all of these young people, these hundreds of thousands of young people are coming back to their country and they're wanting change. They're wanting to drive cars. They're wanting to work. They're wanting to go to movies. They're, they're wanting and seeking and desiring that change. And so... When I was working on this traveling exhibition, I was working with a guy named Bruce Weindrick, who's the CEO of the History Factory, and also wrote uh, the foreword of our book. And Bruce has this mantra, if you will, called start with the future and work back. Uh, a lot of people think history is only about the past, when it really is also about the future. And so as I was traveling on these long flights back and forth to Riyadh, I started thinking about it. And decided, again, just a spark of inspiration to start writing about a CEO, kind of an Elon Musk type of visionary CEO who's always kind of inventing the future and seeing the future. And, but this CEO is turning over the reins of his company to his protege, a younger uh, chief operating officer, a younger woman. And the last thing he has to teach her before he turns over the company is he needs to teach her his secret. And so he takes her into his secret R&D lab uh, in a garage behind the company's headquarters where there is rumored to be a time machine inside. And so he brings her inside and introduces her to his time machine. And the, what, what excites me about this book is that there's a gazillion business books on leadership and how to execute successfully in the business world that come out all the time. But this is fact and science wrapped around a story. So I love where this is going already. So take us through, you know, a little bit more. So, you know, what are, what are some of the things that people are going to get out of this book? And I, and I'd love for you to take us through a bit of a deeper dive. Sure. Well, you know, as you talked about in that introduction at the beginning, and by the way, thank you for that very nice introduction you gave me at the beginning. Uh, I am an experienced designer. You know, I work on theme parks, I work on corporate, you know, visitor centers, and I work on museum exhibits. And this book is written like a theme park ride. And it starts with this CEO and his protege standing in front of a garage door. And the garage door slowly opens up. And again, every great theme park ride, it starts with some type of iconic element that draws you in. And next, uh, he walks her through this winding corridor 
where he introduces his protege to this collection of artifacts that he has about important stories from the past. Uh, there's spark plugs and an eight-track tape player and a cash register from the you know turn of the century. I'm talking about the 19th century. It's into the 20th century. And that's just like a queue in a theme park ride. And we forget sometimes what the purpose of a queue is. We think often that in a theme park ride, it's just standing in line. Well, the best theme park attractions, that queue is about establishing trust. It's establishing context. I'm assuming, have you been to Universal Studios and been to the Harry Potter attraction? Right. When I went in there for the first time with my daughter, Zoe, who illustrated the book, she was 14. And we're standing there. and She's a huge Harry Potter fan. And Zoe said, Dad, this is legit. This is legit. The great, great attractions in this world build trust in that queue. And the whole purpose of that first chapter, the first chapters of the book, is to establish trust. Then what happens? The CEO takes his protege into this really cool Vegas-like rotunda with the Roman god Janus, and it looks like Vegas. And in that space, the CEO gives her the information she needs to move forward in the journey. And it's the same in any great theme park ride. Uh, You next go from that queue where trust is built into the pre-show where you get the information you need to move forward and move forward in the journey. Uh, same at that Harry, go back to that Harry Potter ride. You know, you go into the pre-show, the D- defense of the dark arts class, and they tell you what happened, what needs to happen next and the information you need. And then of course the CEO takes uh, his protege down into his lab where the time machine is located. And again, any great theme park ride, what happens next is you actually get on the ride. You internalize that message. And she has a very important decision to make as to whether she's actually going to engage that time machine because there's a lot of ethics involved in in time travel. And and then finally, what we want to have happen in any great theme park attraction is we want to actually challenge people to do something. Now, most people think that's, oh, you just want us to buy a t-shirt, but that's really not what the best attractions are all about. The best attractions are about involving you in the story. So, for example, when I went again on that Harry Potter ride at Universal Studios, I'm standing in the retail store with my family. It wasn't about which Quidditch jersey to buy. It was about which house we belonged in. Who is Slytherin? Who is Hufflepuff? Who is Ravenclaw? And who is Gryffindor? And which which part of, of, of the story do we belong in? And so that's what it's really about. And at the end of the day, what do I want people to take away from this book? I want them to become part of the story. I want them to understand that, you know, even if you have a time machine and you can travel back in time, or even if you have a time machine and you can travel to the future, you still have to make those important decisions today. I mean, I could go back to 1918 and talk to anyone about the Spanish flu, but I still have to come back to 2020 and make a decision. And I could go into the future three years from now and learn about what has happened, but I still have to come back and make a decision today. It's really an interesting point. And I, and I know we're bringing this into, into business. So let's talk about the decision-making process that businesses need to be thinking about and how our decisions impact the future. Well, way too many businesses ignore their past, and I think they do so at their peril. Uh, I mean, one one example uh, from my own personal experience is you know, I've done a lot of work with Honeywell. I think Honeywell is a great company, uh, but they ignored their past. And guess what happened? Honeywell invented the round thermostat, and then Nest reinvented it. <laughs> and, you know, and Sometimes companies just get embarrassed by their past. They don't want to talk about their past, but they should. They should embrace and learn from their past. And and by the same token, you know, all you have to do at any company, uh, whether it be IBM or Honeywell or GE, you know, the future of that company is already there. You know, the future of my little company, Creative Principles, is probably my daughter, Zoe, you know, and my other two children who are still in college. That's probably the future. So don't ignore the future. You have people right now in your company who are the future of your company. And too often we ignore their voices and don't listen to them when they are actually the future. So 
for somebody listening to this and they're thinking about their own company, what are some steps that people can take so that they don't make that mistake? Well, I think it goes back to that mantra that Bruce Weindrick uh, invented from the History Factory. Start with the future and work back. Where do you want to be? Where do you want to go? And then now look back in your own career, look back in your own personal life at those milestones that help to inform where you actually want to go to the future. I think that's one very important step that people, that people can follow. I mean, you know, the other, there, there's lots of layers to this book. And what's interesting about it is people that come from different perspectives get different messages. Uh, I've had conversations with people that they're only obsessed about the ethical decision at the end. I've had other people that were just like, man, you know, I worked at this company for 25 years and my boss never listened to me. And one important theme in this book is listening to, to th- those people in your organization who typically are not listened to. Uh, uh, one of the stories we tell is of, of John Lasseter and Pixar. I mean, he was fired from Disney Animation Studios. The person who invented Pixar and that Disney had to buy for $7.2 billion was fired by Disney. So what happened? Uh, you know, we, we sometimes don't have enough tolerance for these young, really creative, visionary people who truly are the future. And we really need to give them a little bit of room to exercise uh, their creativity so they can create the future and hopefully create the future where they are so it'll benefit you. That makes perfect sense. I did not, I didn't know that about uh, the the creator of Pixar. What a what a costly lesson for Disney. How interesting. No, I mean and there are other examples all over the place. I mean, you know, I mean, you can talk about so many different really really creative people who were fired. I mean, I've been fired twice in my career. You know, Walt Disney himself got a poor job review from the Kansas City newspaper where he worked. Basically called him a poor animator and not very creative. (laughs) So, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, One of the things that we talk about in the book is the giggle test, where too often in corporations, someone will have a really kind of interesting and engaging idea and people will laugh at it and giggle at it and, and shut it down. And it's very, very important then when, when we innovate and when we are creative that we don't just naturally laugh at people. And we've all been laughed at. We all have. You know, if there is one big, big message that I think I want people to really take away from this book is if you've ever had an idea and have been laughed at or been shut down and felt like no one is listening to you, don't give up. Because you know what? Um, those ideas are the future. And if you believe in it, you know, keep, keep trying, keep being persistent. Don't let those giggles and those smirks, you know, I mean, there, there was, I think a meme out there. Someone put it on, I think their church board that somebody actually in a meeting once proposed doing a movie about sharks sucked up in tornadoes. I mean, (laughs) who would have thought, you know, bottled water, right? Who would have thought bottled water? Who, I mean, it's crazy. I can go get water for free. Why would people buy bottled water? But we do it all the time. So, you know, when it comes to the future, the future is made in the present. And too often it's people are just laughing at those ideas and we need to stop it. So clarify for us, you mentioned the giggle test. So, and, and obviously everyone listening, this can, can relate to having an idea that somebody once laughed at or you know, scoffed at. So, hey, create a podcast about making people happy at work, right? Who wants to hear that? That's so funny. Uh, I actually did experience that <laughs> before I launched this, but yeah, well, who um, laughed at you? Well, I, I'll tell you the story very quickly. So, when I was getting ready to start this podcast, there was a, a service that helped launch podcasts, and they give you a free consultation for fifteen minutes. And so, I called in, and you know, had it scheduled, and gave the idea for my show and they laughed and said that that would never work that it's not niche enough it's you know you can't have a show this this broad based and just say you just want to help people and so happy happy to prove that person wrong three years later but want to have a podcast that helps people (laughs) oh that's a horrible idea but i I do (laughs) we were we were told it was a stupid idea to publish a book during a pandemic but you know what else are we going to do 
<laughs> I, I just just to clarify though, so the giggle test. So how do you how do you know if you're passing or failing this test? Is it that people should be laughing, people shouldn't be laughing? What are we looking for? What's the key? Well, the giggle test is when you are in a meeting and you present an idea and people laugh at you and you shut down because of that. People roll their eyes and they shut down and you shut and you shut down because of it. And you know there there what happens too often is people just stop sharing their ideas and those ideas are about the future. Uh there are a few people, I guess me included who you know, I used to have a colleague that would roll her eyes at me all the time. And I actually started calling her out in every meeting. And I would say, oh, there, there's the eye roll. You know what I mean? There's, there's the eye roll right there. I must be on to something. There's the eye roll. The, the reality is, is if you're going to truly come up with a game-changing idea, it will be something that people will say will fail. It will be something that elicit giggles. Again, I mean, you know, I love this theme park industry. And going back to Walt Disney, uh, there's a book out there by Buzz Price. And nobody knows who Buzz Price is. Uh, But Buzz Price is the economist and the feasibility expert who picked the location of Anaheim and picked the location of Orlando. And so, I mean, Walt Disney wanted to build a theme park. He didn't, Walt Disney didn't pick Anaheim. Walt Disney hired this guy from the Stanford Research Institute and said, hey, where should I put it in Southern California? I mean, they could put it up, you know, in LA by Dodger Stadium. They could do it down in Orange County. There's all kinds of locations in the 1950s in Los Angeles where you could put a theme park. And so, Buzz Price looked at all the data and chose Anaheim. And so after they had selected Anaheim, Disney sent Buzz Price to all the, quote, experts in the amusement park industry. And they met in a hotel in Chicago. And Buzz Price presented the ideas of of Disneyland to the president of Coney Island in Cincinnati, you know, the president of Coney Island in New York, and some other guy that ran a big amusement park somewhere in the country. I don't know where. And these three experts, they were the leading industry experts in the amusement park industry at the time, all said Disneyland would fail. All three said it would fail. And well, fortunately, Walt Disney ignored him. And, and so the bottom line is if you're, if you're going to recommend anything that's a game-changing idea in your industry, no matter what the industry, people, there will be experts, there will be people that will giggle at you. And will roll your eyes at you and will tell you that you will fail. There's some counterintuitiveness to this a little bit, Jeff, because on one hand, it basically the Google test is if people scoff at you, if people say, well, this is a stupid idea, uh, then you know that it, it could be a good idea. On the other hand, we also know that it takes a village, right? So succeeding requires allies and relationships and people that often do believe in us. So how do you, how do you balance and reconcile those two things which appear to be at odds with each other? Well, when you ask it that way, it makes me think of American Idol. You know what I mean? And there's these people that come on American Idol and they're horrible, but they think they're really good. And, and you feel so bad for them. You know what I mean? And so there are such a thing as bad ideas. I mean, there are. <laughs> there are stupid ideas. <laughs> So how, how can you decide whether it's a great idea, whether it's not? And how can you, how can you recruit all these other people into the process? I mean, oh, geez, I, I don't know if we even, that might be another book on, on that subject. But, you know, the, the real interesting thing is when you look at great leaders, great leaders are able to inspire a shared vision. Walt Disney, for example, was able to inspire a shared vision about what Disneyland could be. There were detractors for sure, but he was able to inspire a shared vision. And, and, you know, if we can do that, if we can inspire a shared vision, I mean, my job, you know, I just did a big project in Singapore where I was the creative director and it was, uh, you know, a brand experience and it was a fun, really cool job. Well, my job, you know, you know, I, helped to help to put the team together. And we had, you know, videographers, we had artists, we had animators, we had fabricators, we had all these different people on the team. Well, my job is to really inspire a shared vision from a creative perspective about what it can really be. And so that's, 
you know, that's how you take that kernel of an idea and actually grow it into something much bigger is to inspire a shared vision. I love that. Well, I, didn't, I didn't invent that, by the way. <laughs> inspire a shared vision comes from uh, Jim Cousins and Barry Posner in their book, The Leadership Challenge. No, but but it's it's so well said, and uh, I've this has been such an interesting discussion. I, I don't think we've ever had a show where we've broached American Idol, Harry Potter, and talking about Disney. So I, I am very grateful for this conversation. And unfortunately, we are at time, Jeff. As you know, I wrap Already up. Already, every- how that happen? <laughs> just because we're just having a fun, creative discussion, and no giggling, though, no giggling. So we didn't uh, we didn't put anybody on the spot, but nonetheless, I, and I think we already did this. I think you mentioned this kind of midway through that this question I ask everybody is sharing your biggest helping, that one most important piece of information that you want somebody to walk away with after hearing our conversation. So reiterate that just so that we really Don't hammer be that afraid. home. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to share your ideas. Don't be afraid. People will laugh. People will giggle. That's okay. Don't be afraid to share your ideas because one of those ideas just might change the world. That's so well said. Uh, Tell us where people can connect with you online and get their hands on this book. Sure. Well, it's the CEO's Time Machine and uh, you can find it on Amazon and all the usual outlets. We have a a great website that's very easy to find, ceotimemachine.com. That's (laughs) ceotimemachine.com. So, and, and again, we, you know... It is a short book. It takes 30 minutes to read. Every page is an illustration. So if you just like pretty pictures, uh, this is the book for you. Perfect. And uh, for those of you listening to this on the treadmill, everything Jeff Thatcher and CEO Time Machine will be linked in his show notes at thedailyhelping.com as well as in the Daily Helping app available in Google Play and iTunes. Well, Jeff, this has been a really fun conversation. Thank you so much for coming on the Daily Helping today. Thank you very much, Dr. Richard. Absolutely. And I want to thank everybody who listened to this as well. If you like what you heard, go subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review because that's what helps other people find the show. But most importantly, go do something nice today for somebody else. Post it in your social media feeds using the hashtag MyDailyHelping because the happiest people are those that help others. 